Hello and welcome to Gabbit Media. I'm Grant Abbott and today we're looking at this building which I'm going to call the ultimate outpost at the moment but I think it's going to come up with a different name when they put it in game so you're getting a sneak preview of this building. So the game is called Atlas Empires and it's available now so you can go and download it and see what you think. It's like Pokemon Go meets Clash of Clans type scenario. Also in the description you'll see lots of playlists that relate to this and my course is available now. I've got an art course that's just come out and it's on sale so uh, go and test it out see see what you think <laughs> so this will be mainly a time lapse and i'll just be going through with a commentary over the top about um, how i made it with lots of tips and tricks so let's get started so this time rather than starting off with the low poly shape i actually went into sculpt mode that seems a bit strange for low poly objects but i thought for a mountain a sort of mountainous region that this castle sits on top of it would be a good idea to get the shape with sculpting, it's just a bit more free than uh, blocking out uh, with cubes and box modeling as it's known as. So just digging into a, a shape and sculpting and um, organically modeling like this is more my style really. So once I've got the shape down and I'm quite pleased with it, then I sort of chop it up and position my objects. Uh, so this is basic sort of box modeling now uh, that we're more used to. Start with a cylinder and put a, a cone on the top so it's all fairly straightforward. Then when I've got that shape in, I can remodel the base again, make sure that the um, rocks are sort of digging into the castle and all that sort of thing. And it's important to do that, get other shapes in, uh, so you know how the relationship between all of them and how they're going to marry up before going into any details with them. So it looks like I'm going into details with the rocks, but um, or the cliff, I should say, but it's not really detailed at all because it's going to be sort of remeshed into a much low, lower poly model. Just adapting the roof now, and I actually stick out some tiles. So you've got to think about your silhouette when you're creating low poly objects. So the silhouette being the outline as it's seen from different angles. So just having a very flat sort of cone on the top uh, wouldn't be a great silhouette and breaking it up with a few sort of jutting out tiles will help it a lot. Using the mirror tool on my cylinder means I only have to do part of the shape. I actually apply that mirror modifier before I go into painting later on because I want to be able to paint different parts differently. Uh, but for the sake of modeling, it's much easier to use the mirror tools to speed the workflow up. Then we've got this door object here, and this is the surround to the door. So again, think about the silhouette, make things sort of jut out from it and give it some more character. And I start off with a plane with that. I find it so much easier than uh, modeling with a cube because you can just model it from one angle and uh, keep it nice and flat, get the shape you want, and then just extrude it. And uh, that's the way I do a lot of things. Start with a plane rather than a cube. Makes life much easier. So at this point, I've got most of the base shape down and I'm just adjusting things and making more tiles stick out from the roof. And you can see the difference it makes in terms of the silhouette. Now I go in and decimate my cliffs and rocks. You might have seen that I made a copy of that, so the decimate process is destructive, so I like to have a copy of my original in case I make some sort of mistake and want to go back to it or change the shape slightly. The decimate modifier is really good because it triangulates the mesh for you and you can really reduce it right down but keep its structure. If it was just a basic remesh, it can sort of lose its shape a bit. So having those sort of triangulated meshes as well uh, creates that sort of interesting low poly feel and uh, the mesh sort of jumps around sort of randomly in a sense. You see I deleted the base of the mesh as well, we won't see any of the bottom faces so make sure you get rid of those in your low poly meshes, especially if they're for games. You always want to be going around like I am here, deleting any uh, faces that aren't going to be used and also any overlap, try and get rid of that because that's going to influence your UVs and the UV space that you have. Now I go around sort of unwrapping and sometimes I'll do a smart UV project, other times I'll actually unwrap properly. This time I unwrapped properly by marking seams because the smart UV project, although it's good, sometimes just doesn't do what I want it to do and it takes a long time to readjust that than it does to just mark your seams yourself. You can see here that I've still got the mirror on and unwrapping and then I'll apply it all before unwrapping fully um, so I can get an idea of uh, marking the seams whilst it's mirrored and then when I apply the mirror all those seams will be on the other side. If I don't apply the mirror whilst it's unwrapped that could cause me problems because as soon as I paint on one side it will appear on the other. You'd think that would save time but actually you get a seam down the middle and it looks ugly so I always like to rather than have a mirrored UV which is uh, keeping the mirror applied I like to actually apply the mirror and then unwrap again to make sure I've got two separate 
UVs for each side of the mirrored object. You can see as well, I baked out the map or the light map for the rocks. That's just a bit of a handy tip to help you light your objects in texture painting. So you add a light to the scene um, or maybe something like an HDRI and then you bake the light that comes from that just by doing a simple bake of the color information. And that's really helpful because you don't have to go in and try and shade it all and get the cracks and crevices. They're just all there for you and then you can paint on top like you see me doing here. I actually quite like the white rocks, but it didn't really match up to the other rocks that were in previous outpost versions. So I had to make them a bit more gray and dull. Uh, and it was, they are sort of dull in a sense, and uh, there's a bit more life to the sort of whitish rock here, uh, which I would have liked to have kept, but you've got to marry the objects up, make sure they work together. And if one looks totally different, it just stands out too much and it looks like it's made by someone else and, and just added in later. You, you've got to make sure there's consistency across your game. It's very easy to change the color. You can just go in and add a multiply or a screen or a color blend mode to your fill brush and it just paints it all in. So that's quite easy and fairly obvious in a sense. Uh, but it's quite a good feature within Blender that you can do that. It's like adding an overlay mode and that means you can uh, go in and paint something with all the uh, light and dark areas and then add just color elements on top of that rather than destroying any of the information you've got there. The painting process takes a lot longer than the building process. It's quite a laborious, labor intense task. Uh, going around adding all these colors and uh, shadows and things. I do really enjoy it though. I can sort of sit there tinkering away for hours really uh, and it just slowly comes to life. It's really enjoyable. I like objects like this as well where I can add the shadows in. When you've got a set and you've got to think about uh, reusing objects, you can't add so many um, shadows coming from other objects onto your object because if you reuse it, suddenly the other object attached to it won't be there so you'll suddenly have these shadows that don't make any sense so you've got to be a bit careful of that really. In terms of painting the windows I always paint a sort of really dark area inside as if we can't see in and what I'm doing here is sort of isolating a selection to paint on quite often I'm doing that anyway you can go into edit mode select some faces and when you go back into texture paint mode there's a button just next to the mode and that you can isolate the faces that you've selected and only paint on them and that's a really useful handy thing to be able to do. Lots of people ask me about other options apart from Blender as painting programs and texture painting. And I know there's Armour Paint out there, but I've never actually tried it fully. I've sort of delved into it to see what it looks like and things, but never had a good go with it. It's just that I'm used to Blender, so I end up using it an awful lot. Uh, but I don't think it's really there. I feel like it has some problems and sometimes uh, where's the sculpting they've fixed the sort of normal orientation and painting direction they don't seem to have done any work on the painting section for quite a while now and that's a bit of a disappointment really because that's something I use so often but I suppose when you think about the future maybe this is a dying art it's difficult to say I know it'll certainly be with us for a good few years and things just don't die out but in terms of popularity I'm not sure about hand painted versus realistic and so forth it's difficult to say isn't it in terms of the bricks, you can see I've given them slightly different colors. So that was that color blend mode. And I went in and just colorized some different bricks to make them stand out a bit more and juxtapose them against the other ones. Now the roof tiles here, you can see I'm being very sort of random, trying to make it look very higgledy piggledy, as I call it. Uh, it gives it real character, that does. And also I mark out all the uh, roof tiles to start off with. So I'm kind of drawing them in with a very dark color. So it's a bit like sketching in a way, you just sort of sketch them on there. And then I'm going in adding the highlights. And after that, I'll add in some shadows under each of the roof tiles, as you can see me doing here. And then it's a case of maybe coloring a few, just really minor adjustments to, to the color, uh, really uh, very subtle. And you can see me doing that here. So slight purple there, slight greens, just going slightly away in the hue to make a subtle change in the roof tiles, as if they're sort of, picking up a different reflection, bit, different bit of light from somewhere else. And again, it gives it that bit of character. 
So how long did this take me? It's usually around sort of 10 hours-ish uh, for each of these. It does depend and vary a lot, uh, maybe a little bit quicker on this one than some of the sets, certainly. Um, but it always takes a while to uh, finish one of these, uh, especially um, there was a few changes needed with this one. So um, I sent it off to Chris, the lead artist, and I, it, some good comments came back. It was a little bit dull, and it was in a sense, if you see where it is now, and there's it's just very simplistic, uh, and there's not a lot of life to it. So he suggested a few, uh, adding a few sort of detail elements. So I added um, some, well, you'll see them in a moment, but some sort of areas of interest to um, add some color, add some character, and uh, make it uh, an interesting shape to look at rather than just a castle on a hill or a cliff. That's one thing that I really am pleased about when I'm working with a team. You can get feedback. It's not, it's not always great, is it, to sort of send an object off and then uh, it comes back or they say, oh, can you make some changes? It doesn't feel great, but it's really, really important that that happens for growth and your objects uh, looking much better. Uh, it, and you should really do that. If you haven't got anybody available, then go onto a forum, ask for some feedback. It will really boost your work. You don't have to listen to everything that people say and some people may come at back with not very useful comments but generally speaking uh, you're going to get a few comments and if lots of people are saying the same thing then you know that's something you need to listen to. As for the lead artist he's very experienced so I know I can trust him with his ideas obviously <laughs> and are very respectful of his work uh, so it's really good to get some feedback from such a good professional like that. And you can see me here adding in those extra detailed elements. Um, so I thought some uh, wooden support beams holding up the top castle would be a good idea. So I built some of those and obviously repeated those around the mesh. Um, it took me a while to come across the idea of the best way to make them. So I experimented with a few things. So you can see that going through a few iterations there. But just a simple triangle, I thought, yeah, why don't I just do that? And sometimes the simplest method is the best method. Also, I'm adding a sort of a ring around the base, so a sort of metallic ring to make it a bit more special, and a ring around the top. Uh, just simple uh, things, but they add a bit more character, add a bit more life, and make it stand out from the crowd, as it were. It is a bit of a pain, though, adding extra elements, because you've got to think about your UV map. You've already unwrapped everything and packed it into your UV area, so you've got to find space for these extra things, which can be a little bit awkward. That's why I'm a bit naughty in a sense. I don't work on my packing when I'm trying to squeeze them all into an area. It doesn't save a huge amount of space or um, it just takes more time rather than save you any space. So uh, I leave a bit of area, a few areas and then I can just slot these things in if I need to do any extras. And it saved me quite a lot of aggro in, uh, that I've had in the past. I have been tempted to use uh, UV packing add-ons, uh, Packmaster or whatever they are, um, and they really compress everything and give you that bit more space, but, uh, which is obviously very helpful and very useful and really optimal. But um, if you're working for a studio with lots of other people and you want to make changes, it can be really tough if you want to add anything in. So, uh, and you'd really, you'd have to remap it all, bake it all out, it's just loads of time. So. Just leaving a little bit of space just in case is, is not going to cost the performance of the game much, so probably worth doing. Now this symbol on the front I really wasn't pleased with, but I'd spent so much time on it <laughs> that I thought, right, just, just get it done and get it sent off because I know they're waiting for these models and it was taking too long. Uh, so I, don't, I thought, thought that symbol might be quite cool and then when I looked at it again I thought, no, I don't really like that. Uh, so I've actually put a sword in front of it for the render here and I might send off and say oh, I'll just put these swords in front of it. <laughs> Save my embarrassment from my weird symbol that's the front there. Uh, when painting gold it's good to use the um, blend mode, the blend brush, dodge, color dodge. Uh, it's really really useful for painting metals and I wish I'd known that much earlier on in my painting career. So I always like to tell people that. Really important one, color dodge for when you're doing metals. As you can see there it looks really shiny. <laughs> Also you can see that I'm changing the colour every now and again of these objects, these particularly these sort of individual uh, character elements, uh, just to see what they're going to look like. Uh, and that's quite easy, you can go across to your um, fill brush and put it on the colour blend mode and just fill it in with a different colour and see what it looks like. So you'll see me doing that a few times. The blue at the moment, it kind of looked a bit magical and I quite like that. 
but for some reason I just didn't feel it was working. I think it's because I had blue tiles as well. So um, I changed the color across to the red. The red did lose some of its uh, color colorfulness because obviously when you fill in a color, it will fill it all in with that hue. So you'll lose any of the color variation. So I'm going across and you can see I'm doing a bit of a color dodge with some orangey colors there. But um, it lost a little bit of life, I suppose. Um, but I think it looked better in the end. Uh, and I'm glad I went with the sort of reddy, purpley, uh, well, the shiny red metal, ruby red, <laughs> whatever you might call it. Uh, so, yeah, I think it worked out in the end. This was the first time that Chris, the lead artist, asked me to do something completely on my own. He just said, oh, we need a, an ultimate outpost building, so uh, can you come up with something? Uh, and obviously I had my previous designs and I've uh, worked a lot with Chris, so I know the sort of thing he likes. But it was a little bit nerve-wracking uh, because it was the first time uh, I'd done something on my own completely uh, for Atlas Empires. So usually I get concept art and build it from that. Um, so there's always a bit of pressure there. And in a sense, the fact that uh, it did come back, uh, so the first iteration, as it were, uh, came back to me and they said, can you liven it up a bit and so forth. Uh, it adds a bit of pressure, I suppose, uh, but it's a good thing. And I'm glad of the opportunity to stamp my own sort of uh, mark on the game and uh, do my own thing uh, so because I've, I've come up with a few ideas and they've liked them so they kind of trust me to do these things hopefully I haven't let them down and they were pleased with the final model <laughs> but it's really nice and a great experience to be given that responsibility to um, sort of do your own thing and uh, it's nice to be trusted like that I actually did that symbol on a separate layer so I had to sort of bake it out and uh, bake a lot of the things out in the end. Uh, when you do d two different layers, you have to sort of bake them into one texture. So that's what I was doing there with the baking process. And there we have it, the ultimate outpost. I'm not really sure quite what they're going to call it in the game because it's not there yet. So you've got a, a sneak preview of what's coming in the game. So I hope this was insightful to you. Thank you to all those that managed to get this far and watch all the way to this point. Let me know in the comments if you stuck it out this far um, or if you've got any thoughts yourself or questions that I can obviously cover in other episodes. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.